Okay, so welcome to faves number seven. Um, I'm Jessica Satcher. I'm here with Yan Zeng. We're at Phage Directory. And we have our speaker today is Panos Kalatsis from the University of Copenhagen. I'm going to spotlight his video now. So this is Panos. He is here to talk to us about phages in aquaculture. And um, he is a postdoc researcher at the University of Copenhagen, and he's working on uh, phages that are temperate and lytic, the temperate ones. Um, he's looking at their role in bacterial virulence and communication and fitness. And then he's also looking at lytic phages um, that target aquaculture pathogens. And Panos also co-founded a biotech startup called Aquatic Biologicals. So he's, they're working on uh, preventing fish disease for aquaculture. So really excited to hear him talk today. We're gonna have about a 20 minute talk from him. Then we're gonna do some Q and A. And uh, after that, we'll do our signature breakout rooms. So we'll do, depending on time, one or two of those where you'll just be randomized and get to meet some other faces. Those are really meant to be informal. Just introduce yourself, maybe chat about your research um, in groups of four or so. Uh, and just to note that I don't record the breakout rooms. So um, that's just for you to chat with whoever's in there. We won't, we won't put that in the recording. Um, and okay, and so yeah, we will kind of get going then. So we're just still admitting people. Jan will be monitoring the chat. If you have any technical issues, just use the chat. Or if you want to ask questions to Panos, feel free to just use the chat all throughout. And then I'll kind of read them. He'll read some of them. And maybe we'll have people unmute to ask some of their questions, depending on how many there are. So we're going to get going. So the floor is yours, Panos. And Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, uh, for the introduction and for the opportunity. Thank you, Jean, for being responsible for the uh, for this great initiative. Um, so today, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm, uh, despite I'm working with both lytic and uh, temperate phases, I'm going to talk about uh, the lytic uh, side of my, of my work. So uh, that's why uh, the talk is entitled Does the Potential of uh, Phage Therapy in Aquaculture. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll try to... We don't see the slideshow version, though. We just see... Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let, me, let me check that. Let me confirm. Sure. Hmm, I have a small issue with that. That should be okay. Can you hit that button at the bottom right corner to go to presenter mode? Let me check. Okay, now it's better? Yep, perfect. Okay, fantastic. Sorry for that uh, small delay. So, uh, uh, as I said, let me remove that. As I said, I'm going to talk about the potential of phage therapy in aquaculture. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to set up uh, a little bit of background on aquaculture. Uh, and uh, I would like to say that aquaculture is the fastest growing industry of animal production uh, for consumption globally. This is a graph that uh, I took from the latest report of Food and Agricultural Organization in 2020. And here we can see that uh, we have a, an, another a new record number of aquaculture production and biomass. Uh, and I would like to mention that um, it has been uh, the fastest growing industry uh, for the past at least four to five decades. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to mention that in 2016, the world fish supply per capita uh, surpassed that of captured fisheries. Uh, but let me contextualize a little bit this uh, background information in numbers. The contribution of aquaculture to the global production uh, is approximately 46% in the last report. Uh, that can be translated in a biomass of 114.5 million tons. And in uh, sales, the value is approximately $263.6 uh, billion. Uh, as per the human uh, side of things, uh, we have uh, observed, or it, it is reported actually, that 17% of uh, uh, fish contribution, 17% um, of the animal protein supply is attributed to fish. 
uh, and 7% uh, of the total protein is also attributed to fish. And the record number is 20 kilograms, which is the fish consumption per capita that was recorded in 2018. However, the production and the growth of aquaculture is hampered by the diseases in, uh, in aquaculture. So uh, then uh, we can see that uh, according to the World Bank in 2014, the estimation of the cost of the disease in aquaculture was approximately 6 billion US dollars per year. However, uh, this is gonna grow exponentially probably because of three basic reasons. The first one is the intensification of the production. As we mentioned before, the growth uh, is uh, still going up and there is a much uh, increased need for, for fish uh, and the uh, fish protein. So that constantly increases the, the demands for food without proportional increase of space. The second thing is the diversification of the production. And that actually applies uh, basically and mainly, particularly actually for, for the mariculture, where we have a lot of new species introduced in, uh, in, the, in the aquaculture process. And last, the global warming, which uh, actually has led to the increase of water temperature and favors the development of uh, pathogenic bacteria in areas uh, where, was not, uh, the, where were not previously reported. At this point, I would like to mention that the majority of losses take place during larva stages, so quite early in the, in the, in the production, at the hatchets. And uh, with that, I would like to go a little bit and uh, review uh, the tools that we have uh, when we're talking about the special case of the hatchets. So uh, at the, uh, vaccines could be, a great opportunity, could be a great solution, and they actually work pretty well in aquaculture. But the problem is, that uh, we cannot use them in hatcheries simply because uh, the immune system, the adaptive immune system of the small fish, of the larvae, uh, is in its infancy and also it's actually not present for the crustaceans or the mollusks. Uh, and then there is antibiotics. We all know about them, we hear, we hear them all the time. Uh, and apart from the typical and uh, more classic problem of uh, development of anti antibiotic resistance, we have two uh, other big issues that are mostly specific in, uh, in aquaculture. The first one has to do with the fact that the administration uh, comes through medicated feeds. And that has some problems because first of all, the, the sick fish do not eat, but also uh, that also leads to more than 70, more than 80% of them pass directly into the environment. And another practice that people use in, in, in aquaculture setups is just to, you know, uh, deploy them or administer them directly to, in the water. Uh, so according to the numbers, uh, we have observed uh, approximately 10 times more consumption per, per population correction unit in aquaculture compared to the terrestrial livestock. Uh, and the second reason is that antibiotics severely affect the natural microbiota, which is actually the case in most of the uh, setups where antibiotics are applied. But the problem here is that when we have a small renewal of water or a quite you know, limited renewal of water, it is very difficult uh, to avoid major shifts that will come as a, consequences, as a consequence of the microbiota um, differentiation of the populations. Uh, therefore, uh, I would like to uh, mention phage therapy at this point. We are pretty much familiar with it and basically the four main issues uh, that we consider when we are talking about phage therapy are first to tackle the antimicrobial resistance uh, against antibiotics, which is sort of the, the flagship. Uh, but then we have also the host specificity, which comes uh, as an additional point. And it can be explained by the fact that bacteriophages are very specific on the species level, but also on the strain level. Uh, that makes them quite efficient in removing selectively the opportunistic pathogens. The third point is the environmental sustainability, which is also a prerequisite uh, when we're talking about aquaculture because the, all the companies uh, and the industry needs to do uh, like occasional and regular um, environmental assessment reports. And fourth, the public concern, which actually has been uh, increasingly um, uh, incremental during the last years when it comes to the administration of antibiotics. So, a fair question here is how did bacteria enter the hatchery in the first place? So the point is that of course the companies or the industry in general has uh, different systems of uh, um, treating the water uh, in order to avoid that uh, pathogens come with it inside the hatcheries or such fragile ecosystems. The problem is that uh, in these early stages of growth, 
uh, live feeds are um, administered to the to the to the juvenile larvae, and uh, when the live feed enter the system, they carry uh, potential pathogens such as Vibrio, for example, which is one of the cases, in their gut, and they can survive all these uh, like all these treatments that uh, are done to the water uh, while entering the the hatchery system. So when life is entered, they carry along some opportunistic pathogens, some potential threats for uh, outbreaks, for future outbreaks. Our first idea or the, the plan that we have been working for, for several years and we have been um, uh, experimenting with is to use the bacteriophages as a smart disinfectant in um, these fragile systems, in the hatchery systems. And uh, smart disinfectants basically can be translated in removing selectively potential opportunistic pathogens from the hatchery system. Uh, here you can see, and let me know if you can see my, my, my pointer here, my, my mouse. So uh, we used a combination of these two uh, lytic phages, um, ST2 and GRN1, which uh, were able actually to decrease by 1.3 logs or 93% uh, in plain numbers, the native Vibrio bacterial load after four hours uh, that we treated them into the uh, live feeds, Artemia salina in this case. So we definitely can see that there is a potential for them to, to be used as, uh, uh, as disinfectants when it comes to the, to the live feed. However, we took it one step uh, further and we went also to, uh, to use uh, phages as, uh, uh, as disinfectants in, uh, in fish larvae. So what we did is that uh, in an experiment later on, we used uh, like 26, 24 well plates, these uh, plastic plates that you can see over here. Uh, each of these well contained one egg, one fish egg. In this particular uh, case, it was cod. And then we tried to infect these eggs uh, with uh, some uh, already isolated and characterized pathogens, Vibrio angularum in this case. And we tried to apply a lytic bacteriophage, KVB40, in order to uh, see if that phage has the ability to enhance survival. Uh, the findings of this study were not uh, like uh, uh, as expected because the eggs, even of the controls, uh, as you can see over here in the black dots, uh, they um, uh, showed very high mortality rates and that was basically because of the quality of the eggs. But as soon as we uh, treated all the conditions, both the eggs without the bacteria and the eggs uh, that were not infected with the bacteria uh, with phages, we were able to notice that the, 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 that the eggs that were treated with KVB40, with this bacteriophage, were uh, able to survive better uh, by um, reporting a 60% mortality compared to the controls. So after these findings, we realized that uh, there is already a, a native bacterial load even behind, even before the, the infection process with uh, our pathogens. Uh, and uh, for this, I would like to, to complement uh, this study, uh, which is uh, done by some colleagues in, uh, in Finland. And actually, uh, this group showed that uh, uh, they use rainbow trout. They used uh, uh, like uh, aquaria instead of, uh, of plastic um, 24 well plates and also a little bit bigger fish. And in this particular case where they infected the, the larvae with the Flaubacterium psychrophilum, another very uh, severe pathogen for Baltic aquaculture, uh, they combined this um, uh, phage treatment with uh, these two bacteriophages, lytic bacteriophages, and we're able to notice that uh, these phages granted a much higher level of protection, 83 to 87%, uh, uh, compared to the controls. So that was actually a really, really impressive result. And uh, another, another very useful finding of this study is that this uh, protection could be granted even if the phages were deployed at a lower concentration. So that was the MOI. Uh, 0.02 and the MOI2. So the phages presence was able actually to grant a quite high level of protection. Uh, that being said, I would like to, to specify and to clarify at this point that we are talking about lytic phages, of course, when we're talking about phage therapy. And I prefer to, to show, uh, instead of uh, graphical representation of the cycles of lytic and lysogenic cycle, I would prefer to show uh, some uh, real uh, lab stuff, uh, time lapse uh, that uh, we have recorded. And here you can see some bacteria, it's Vibrio angularum in this case. 
uh, where we have uh, also added some bacteriophage. And you can see in time, I will push play, you can see in time how they are actually uh, eliminated by the phage. So you can see that the bacteria dots are over here. The video is approximately, is a time lapse of uh, uh, five hours. And you can see that uh, the bacteria are actually uh, killed uh, by, by the phage over time. And uh, this is quite, uh, it, it was quite impressive as an observation, but we wanted to take a closer look and see how the lysis event looks. So what we did is that we zoomed in uh, some of the bacteria and we wanted to record this burst moment. And we were actually successful because here you can see this bacterial cell in, in real time, that's a real time recording. So I will play it one more, one more time. It sort of bursts, it, it puffs after the uh, successful infection of, uh, by the KV before the bacteriophage. So uh, it's actually um, able to, to translate that also into the, the bacteria alone. This is an experiment that uh, many of the phage people do on a regular basis. So we actually recorded that one as well in order to, to demonstrate and show how lysis works. This is a, a Petri dish which is covered by the bacteria alone of Eduardsiella anguillarum, uh, another uh, important fish pathogen. Uh, and uh, we have uh, sort of added here a couple of drops of a very lytic phage, which is called SAR. And you can see over time, this is a 24 hour video. You can see over time how the lytic um, drops are uh, progressing and how the bacteria alone and the growth of this uh, Duarcella aguilarum is inhibited by the presence of the, of the lytic bacteriophage SAR. Uh, I would like though to, to point at this moment that you can see this small uh, underneath development of these uh, small colonies here, uh, which are actually the resistant ones. So it's not that we have solved entirely the problem because resistance and development of the resistance is always a significant parameter that we need to take into account when we're talking about phage therapy. Uh, bacteria and the phages co-evolve, so uh, they have actually, bacteria are able to, to come up with many uh, mechanisms Either they have to do with uh, the viral attachment itself, or maybe preventing the DNA injection, maybe digesting the DNA after the injection, and uh, also the abortive infection system, which also represents some sort of suicide when it uh, comes to a very heavily um, infected cell. So uh, the development of the resistance is, is something that will, have, that, that will happen. Eventually, uh, it will happen. So the point is, we would like to examine uh, if that comes at a cost or not. And according to our research, but also what is available in the literature, we have noticed that uh, this development of resistance comes both with a virulence and with a fitness cost. The first, uh, in the first uh, case, we have already observed that there are phase resistance strains that were less virulent uh, when we did the fish larvae experiment compared to the white type. And when it came to the fitness, we show differences in the growth rates uh, and also in the rates of degradation and specific um, uh, substrates. So we checked some elastase and chitinase activity and we saw that the resistance, uh, the resistance strains had uh, decreased capacity of uh, degrading these uh, uh, substrates compared to the wild type. So it definitely comes at a cost. However, this is not the only challenge that we face when we do the phase therapy. And I've mentioned here three of the, of the major ones. Uh, the first one has to do with licensing, second with upscaling, and the third with the viability. Briefly, uh, when it comes to licensing, um, the legislatory framework is not yet very well defined uh, when it comes to the European setup at least. So uh, it's not yet certain if we can follow the, uh, the way of, uh, of a drug or the way of a fish additive, or feed additive sorry, to, to sort of commercialize the products. Uh, we know that the compassionate use can be encouraged, but this is also uh, subjected to the national legislation. When it comes to upscaling, uh, there is a lot of progress uh, that has been recorded so far. There are actually some very, very potent bioreactors already in the, in the market and uh, a lot of available equipment able to proliferate phages. However, we need to make sure that uh, this equipment and protocols have been uh, well adapted to each system that we are working with uh, and also we need to make sure that the phage proliferation or the, the final product comes free uh, from any kind of byproducts such as uh, endotoxins that were released or can be released during phage proliferation. 
The last thing is the variability, and that's something that um, we cannot really predict because it has to do with the genomic diversity that each of the bacterial target can demonstrate. So some of the bacteria like Vibrio are extremely diverse. Others like uh, Photobacterium or Flavobacterium, they are more conserved. So that has to do definitely with, uh, with the level of research that we have done when it comes to its specific, of the, its specific uh, species. And uh, at this point, I would like to uh, take a couple of minutes in order to introduce to you uh, the aquatic biologicals. Jessica mentioned that in the beginning of the talk. Uh, and uh, this is a startup company. It has to do with uh, uh, aquaculture health. It's a company that I was involved uh, one year ago, more or less. Uh, the major uh, task of this company is the uh, development and research of autogenous vaccines. Uh, and this has to do a lot with the uh, shortage when it comes to commercially available vaccines, particularly for mariculture. However, uh, we offer uh, different um, uh, services as well, and they have to do with advanced diagnostics when it comes to aquaculture diseases. Uh, also with phage therapy, which is the part that I am uh, sort of uh, on top of, and I am trying to um, uh, sort of uh, curve the, uh, the strategies and uh, uh, follow the pathway that we need in order to uh, achieve successful candidates for phage therapy in aquaculture. And the last part is consulting, which basically has to do with the, the protocols and the um, sort of uh, daily procedures that need to be followed by uh, aquaculture uh, units uh, that uh, will basically um, secure uh, a high, high level of hygiene, which is the prerequisite of, uh, of top level aquaculture health. Uh, you can feel free, of course, and uh, uh, visit the website and see also the team uh, and uh, also the description that we have over there. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, close my talk and uh, I would like to uh, share the, the, my email here. Feel free to, to contact me. And uh, if you have any, any further questions, you can also reach out in LinkedIn and, uh, and, and Twitter. I would like to thank um, the Fades directory for making this talk possible again. And also all my colleagues and uh, collaborating institutes for the work that we have been doing so long uh, together. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Panos. Here's my single person applause. There's multiple people applauding. Just imagine it. Okay. <laughs> great, great. Let me, let me uh, stop sharing and get back to the Zoom. Great. Yeah. So we have some awesome questions coming in. Fantastic. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start asking them. Um, mm -hmm. So from Natalie Ma, how much is actually known about the baseline microbiota and perturbing it at this point in comparison, for instance, to human gut or human skin? Yeah, so uh, we, we have uh, plenty of uh, uh, different research and uh, manuscripts uh, working on uh, microbiota in aquaculture. Uh, that is something that is uh, still ongoing. We have a lot of uh, works done on the hatcheries and we know that, for example, vibrios are uh, quite essential uh, in, in the marine hatcheries, particularly marine hatcheries. But there are also other works that uh, have been, uh, have been um, sort of uh, elaborating with the natural microbiota uh, in the mucus uh, or in the fish gut. And we have actually um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, results that support the fact that they may even play some role in the immunity of the fish. Like the phages that are present in the mucus might contribute also to the immunity of the fish. So there's definitely uh, a lot of information uh, published already and uh, a lot more is coming. I can definitely say that because we have also, uh, I, can told, I can say that uh, on behalf of, of my uh, colleagues that we have also some interest on that, uh, on that level as well. Uh, okay, from Atif Khan, where do you, uh, what are your locations for isolating the phages against these fish pathogens? Okay, that's great. So, in principle, I can say the, the general rule that wherever is the disease, there is a phage. <laughs> so, the best samples or the best places to isolate phages from, I would say, uh, are the places that you have the report of the disease. For example, when you are when we're working about vibriosis uh, and we want to isolate phages against vibriosis in the hatchery, we need to sample the hatchery. Or when we're talking about the cages in the sea, we need to go to the sea and take some samples there. Could be water samples or it could be tissues. 
uh, and uh, then process them and try to find the pages if they are there, of course, using the right hosts. Do you find them easy or hard to find? Or would I would say my, th this, is, this is my personal rule of thumb is 10%. <laughs> But that is out of experience. <laughs> Got it. Um, One out of 10, more or less. Got it. This is from No Padal. Um, a question about how to tell people that I give viruses to treat bacteria on our fish farm. So kind of a question of public, um, what perception, have you kind of thought about that? Yeah, well, uh, actually, let me let you, let me let me add to the previous one, but it, it also depends on the bacterial host, right? Because we have plenty of phages for one, but none for another. So that is also a, uh, just to close the parenthesis. Yeah. So now, when it comes to the application, uh, I think that uh, the producers would be uh, sort of convinced to use the phages as soon as they can see results. Mm. Uh, and uh, the key point is that. Uh, they can actually uh, eager, they, they are actually eager to collaborate in order to uh, use, for example, their facilities as an, an experimental scale uh, setup. And then as long as they can see results, I am pretty sure that they will be able to use the phages. But before that, I would have to mention that the biggest, let's say, problem is the legislation. Because right now I cannot, for example, go to the lab, produce some phages and go to the industry and give the phages away because that is illegal. So we need definitely to define first a specific legislatory pathway that which need to be followed. And then as soon as the products are developed, then they can be used by the producers. For example, in Southeast Asia, I know that uh, there are farms that they are using pages, but the legislation over there is different. So it's different when we're talking about Europe or we're talking about the geographical, other geographical uh, locations. Got it. Um... Okay, I'm gonna go down to this question from Ben Burroughs. Um, do you know the binding kinetics of your phage? Would a high affinity binding phage work better in an aquaculture application where the phages and hosts are very dilute? Let's start with that. Well, um, I'm not sure I got the question entirely because, uh, well, if, you, if you're talking about the binding or the, yeah, the binding potential uh, on the bacterial host, well, that's, of course, something that you need to, to, to test because, uh, for example, when we, are, uh, when we are isolating new phases, we always uh, test the absorbance rate. So we always test uh, what is the time necessary for this phage to be absorbed and attached on the bacterial host, uh, if that's the question. But if the question is about some surfaces, then it uh, touches upon a different technology that uh, it's, again, uh, out. And it's, there are a couple of... Uh, companies and also labs that they are working a lot with uh, uh, affinity on different kinds of surfaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can also be, be used as a, as a potential application, phase related application. Yeah, you, you understood the question, thank you. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. Awesome, and then um, he also asked, is phage purification really necessary for aquaculture? Um, and if so, why? Right, so uh, the thing is that, as I mentioned before during the talk, uh, when the phage proliferation takes place, uh, there can be a lot of byproducts. And that byproducts are, are most of the time some endotoxins that uh, could lead to high mortalities in the larvae or in the eggs. And I'm saying that because we have seen that in the lab. So it's, it's documented. Uh, if the, the question probably touches upon the fact that if you release the phages in the cages in the open sea, then maybe, you know, there is a, a big area and uh, uh, quite... Um, quite a lot of space. But the problem is that you don't generally apply the, the phages in the open sea. So when we uh, use phage therapy is normally uh, either in the hatchery, which is a semi-closed or maybe very low uh, re water renewal system. Uh, it could be uh, IP uh, with injections and uh, or could be in, in some sort of experimental setup like the 24 well plates. And when we do that, uh, then there is a, a limitation in space and that uh, presence of endotoxins is uh, definitely going to lead to bad results. So I, I believe for sure uh, the phage lysate or the phage product needs to be clean both uh, from byproducts and from media that potentially would favor other bacteria to grow. Thank you. No, no problem. Welcome. He's happy. Awesome. So we have a similar question from Hani and Hani, um, how you envision the phage application happening at fish farms. So it is kind of, yeah, I would love to just hear about that. How do you? 
Yeah, so um, I, I would say my personal opinion here. So um, I would uh, imagine the phages to be applied in more controlled systems. That systems could be the live feed, could be the fish hatcheries, and could be also the RAS, the recirculated aquaculture systems, simply because uh, the, these systems are sort of, we can control the, the, the flow in, flow out, and we can control many conditions because we measure temperature a lot. They are sort of inland facilities, and we have sort of the maximum level of control that we can have when it comes to, to aquaculture. And I believe that this also is the stage, or actually these are the stages, that uh, our actions can have a precautionary effect and not a treatment effect, because that's what we want. The producers value a lot uh, their schedule to be set. They don't uh, want uh, early mortalities because they have a lot of problems with their schedules, a lot of problems with their tanks. And I think that the earlier that you apply the phages, uh, the better the results. And of course, if the, if the conditions are under control, it's you know, the, the best. Uh, just quick, quick thing, Jessica. Sorry, uh, yes. that you need to encapsulate them or to protect them for any other uh, effect, actually, in the aquaculture. I mean, that uh, do you uh, do you think that just applying them in liquid or just encapsulate them to protect them from anything? Right. Uh, so I can say that there are several ways of administration. We have experience with plenty. Uh, we have used them as lysates, like as as, uh, as liquid in a liquid form. We have used them also as um, uh, phage coated pellets uh, in, in, the, in the fish feed. And we have also used them in, in IP form, like in injections. Uh, so uh, they, they, will, they will definitely work uh, in, a, in, a, in a quite efficient level. But the thing is that we need to make sure that they will be present in the environment. And maybe the encapsulated fish feed, for example, uh, could generate very, very, very good results uh, and, and keep them in a steady, in a stable level over time. Yep, thank you. Great. Um, and then Adriana asked, how do you expect to deploy this in larger tanks with larger volumes? Like, I guess, would you need a really high concentration of phages? And how big are these tanks? Right. So um, that, again, has to do with, the first, the nature of the phage, uh, and second, it has to do with the potential of the phage to, to, to proliferate. So, of course, when we're talking about tanks, we're talking about uh, liters uh, of tanks, if we're talking about larvae. Uh, so we're talking about maybe hundreds of liters, maybe tens of liters, depends on the level of the, on how big the, how, how big the fish are, the larvae. Uh, but uh, that actually touches upon directly the biology of the phage. There are phages that can reach up to 10 to 12, 10 to 13 easily. There are others that uh, they can barely reach 10 to the 9. So uh, in this particular point, the most important, uh, uh, the most important tool that we have is uh, optimization through protocols and also through bioreactors. So if you have, for example, a, a very uh, efficient bioreactor, you can use it in order to produce high levels of phages and then concentrate them and reach quite high titers, which will uh, make you actually able to, to use them even in, uh, in 100 liters or 200 liters. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, a big problem as long as you have also tested the um, concentration uh, of these phages in vitro against the bacteria. So maybe, as I mentioned during the, during the talk, if you apply an MOI, a multiplicity of infection of 0 0.1 or 0 0.01, then maybe you have great results in the lab. So then you can use that and uh, extrapolate in order to test in vivo as well. Sorry, I was okay. muted. Uh, okay. I saw a question earlier from Atif Khan. Um, what if another bacteria emerges as a pathogen after killing your target? What, what do you have to say about that? Like, is it known which, which pathogens will emerge after you get rid of, say, the Vibrio um, in a normal fish? Right, okay. That is, uh, yeah, that's a very good question because that touches upon uh, succession, succession of the species. And uh, there are some studies which uh, have to do with the microbiota, as we said previously. Uh, and uh, it is true that uh, as soon as you remove some specific uh, taxa, some specific uh, genera, uh, then maybe some else will take their uh, position. 
So it, it has to do with the natural microbiota. We need to know the pre-existing condition of the natural microbiota. And uh, we need to make sure that we have the numbers over there and what kind of bacteria can rise after this uh, phage administration. Uh, we have um, done some preliminary analysis on that as well. And for example, we have seen that uh, when we target Vibrio and the Vibrio are in very high numbers, when you decrease these numbers of Vibrio, the, there is a slight increase of other bacteria indeed, but we haven't seen, at least experimentally, any particular uh, problem uh, when we did that. Um, and Pranav and Apurva from Vitalis, uh, they're asking about the regulatory hurdles. So what kind of regulatory hurdles are you facing for using phage therapy in aquaculture? I would say that uh, the main problem is that the pathway is not clear enough. And uh, there is not any legislatory pathway that, uh, you know, it says phages should follow this or phages should, should follow that. So it pretty much uh, depends on the on the phage and on the company behind the phage because there are companies uh, that have decided to follow the drug pathway and we're talking about uh, phages that can be applied for human uh, uses uh, like uh, for example salmonella or cholera or something like this uh, there are some companies that they decided to you know let's follow the drug pathway because it's a very stable phage and very uh, very uh, let's say efficient but uh, the, the major problem is that I don't know how long or how far these companies are. And I know that these pathways are taking many, many years. And the, the key about phages or the, 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 the sort of the, 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 the most important, let's say, argument in favor of phages is that they are customizable and they are very species specific or even strain specific. So the major hurdle to me is that you cannot license a final product that just because due to coevolutionary interactions may change in six months or one year. So there needs to be a, a more flexible pathway that will on the one hand assure that we are doing a, a secure use of phage therapy. And on the other hand, will take into account the major advantage of this, uh, of this strategy. Great, awesome. And maybe we'll get this one last question and then we'll go and do some breakout rooms. So. This is from Namika Nadi. I have a fish farm with 80 catfishes. Would specific phages or cocktails that affect multiple pathogens be a better option? Okay, well, uh, okay, nice question. I have to say that uh, I'm not very experienced with uh, catfish, but what I would do if I were uh, our friend, uh, I would go uh, online and search the scientific literature uh, and see what are the most common pathogens in catfish. Or if I had the opportunity, I would uh, sample my catfish and the, and the environment of my catfish in order to see what kind of bacteria are there. And then of course, judging by the host, we could uh, sort of automatically be led to the right phages that would be able to tackle the, the, the pathogens that, that may be present in the catfish. And as per the phage, uh, the best ones should be those that are uh, of broad host range, like they can tackle simultaneously a lot of different strains, pathogens, and also they cannot um, uh, compete to each other. Fabulous. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Panos. You're and welcome. Here, everyone can silently or not silently join me in thanking Panos for his awesome talk and enlightening us on stage and aquaculture. This is a place to watch. I'm excited to see uh, what happens here in this industry. My pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. So, I'm going to stop the recording now.